morning. Welcome to Sunday live stream worship with First Unitarian Church of Hobart, Indiana. My name is Tina Porter, and I'm a member of the First Unitarian a member of the Church of our Worship Committee, and I will be facilitating our service this morning. Hopefully, better than I just said that last sentence. It is great to be with you all again. First Unitarian is at the moment in the midst of a search for a settled minister. During this time of transition, during the search for professional leader, long-term leadership, we are a lay-led congregation. As such, each week going forward, we will be blessed with guest speakers. Some Sundays, we will hear stories and reflections from members of this church. Some Sundays, we will hear teachings from visiting ministers from our own faith tradition, and sometimes ministers from other faith traditions. Today, it is my great joy to, wel to welcome back to our pulpit, the Reverend Karen Armina. Reverend Karen is the minister for the James Reeb UU Congregation in Madison, Wisconsin, and was a member of our church before and during her seminary experience. She comes to ministry out of a background in plant ecology and understands the interconnected web of all existence, both a physical and a theological reality. This understanding leads her to be deeply passionate about how we treat each other and our earth, home. Karen lives with her teenager, Catherine, and their dog, Marvel. Yes, like the comics. Our thanks today, as always, go to our consistently excellent technical crew of James Johnson, John Halstead as moderator, and Valerie Lambert as church administrator, who together make our remote worship possible. And we are again grateful to our music director, Jeremy Jacobson, for his art. You can generously share your offering via PayPal. By the way, the link to PayPal is located um, on the video description of your screen, but also will be added to the chat as a clickable link. Be sure to let your Facebook and Twitter friends know that you are attending worship with us at hashtag first Unitarian Hobart. There is one announcement for today. A congregational meeting has been called for July 19th after worship. This meeting is to discuss, <clears throat> excuse me, discuss and vote on erecting a Black Lives Matter sign in front of the church. More information is available in the weekly update and on our website and Facebook page. Now, will you join with me as we move into an attitude of reverence and worship together? Join with me now as we recite the words of our ritual lighting of the chalice. You see the words are there on the screen for your convenience. We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. Our opening words this morning is the poem for South African women by June Jordan. Jordan is a Jamaican American self-identified bisexual poet, essayist, teacher, and activist. These words were written as a commemoration of the 40,000 women and children who August 9th, 1956 presented themselves in bodily protest against the Donbass in the capital of apartheid presented at the United Nations, August 9th, 1978. 
Our own shadows disappear as the feet of thousands by the tens of thousands pound the fallow land into new dust that rising like a marvelous pollen will be fertile, even as the first woman whispering imagination to the trees around her made for righteous fruit from such deliberate defense of life as no other still will claim inferior to any other safety in the world. The whispers, too, they intimate into the inmost ear of every spirit now aroused, they carousing in ferocious affirmation of all peaceable and loving affirmation and loving amplitude, sound a certainly unbound heat from a bad, baptismal smoke where, yes, there will be fire. And the babies cease alarm as mothers raising arms and heart high as the stars so far unseen, nevertheless hurl into the universe a moving force, irreversible as light years traveling to the open eye. And who will join this standing up? And the ones who stood without sweet company will sing and sing back into the mountains and if necessary, even under the sea. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Our opening hymn is number 153, Oh, I Woke Up This Morning. recite with me the affirmation of faith you see the words there on the screen love is the doctrine of this church the quest for truth is its sacrament service is its prayer and this is our covenant to dwell together in peace to seek the truth in love and to help one another from all who dwell songs of hope and faith arise, then peace, goodwill on earth be sung, through every heart and every tongue, Amen.
want to thank Tina for inviting me to speak with you and be with you in this virtual space this morning. It's been good to see some of your faces. June Jordan wrote the poem that Tina read for us to commemorate women in apartheid South Africa who marched to protest the legislation to extend pass laws to women in 1956. Pass laws were a form of internal passport system designed to segregate the population, manage urbanization, and allocate migrant labor. They severely limited the movements of Black African citizens and other people, requiring them to carry passbooks when outside their homelands or designated areas. The women organized and marched after trying to meet with the Prime Minister to make their case against the pass laws and being refused pushback against oppressions in the form of protest after unsuccessful petitioning has happened in many times and in many places, including the founding of our country. And the phrase, we are the ones we've been waiting for, really encapsulates the drive behind unified protest. The phrase has been famously picked up in the US more than a few times. Sweet Honey in the Rock popularized popularized it when they turned it into a powerful song in 1995. Alice Walker used it as a book title in 2007 for a work that encouraged readers to take faith in the fact that we are uniquely prepared to create positive change. And she reminded us where the phrase had first come from. Barack Obama used it in his 2008 campaign to emphasize the idea that change can only come if we work for it. There's a collectiveness in this phrase, as well as in the whole, po whole poem that I really appreciate. It pushes back against the notion that freedom is about what I get to do and that I'm entitled to that freedom. I'm thinking a lot about that tension this Independence Day and about the idea of liberty and justice for all. The popularization of that phrase was part of an intentional move to instill patriotism at the turn of the 20th century. According to Wikipedia, the Pledge of Allegiance was first published in the September 8th issue of the popular children's magazine, The Youth's Companion, as part of the National Public School celebration of Columbus Day. The event was conceived and promoted by James P. Upham, a marketer for the magazine as a campaign to instill the idea of American nationalism in students and to encourage children to raise flags above their schools. According to Arthur Margaret S. Miller, this campaign was in line with both Upham's patriotic vision as well as with his commercial interest. So the pledge was based on the vision of the founders of this nation. Today, for many, this phrase is a narrow one with the word liberty taken as permission for self-centered behavior and justice meaning the punishment of those who break laws. As I think about how that happened, I see several paths to explore. First, the reasons for the creation and popularization of the pledge itself. <clears throat> the author, <clears throat> The author, Francis Bellamy, was a Christian socialist and minister who was concerned with an ebb in patriotism after the Civil War. Bellamy wanted to do something about that edge ebb, so he built a pledge that had been built on a pledge that had been created five years earlier by Civil War veteran George T. Balch. And the marketer, James Upham, paired the release of the pledge in his magazine with a campaign to sell flags to schools across the nation so that when the world's Columbian exposition opened on the 400th anniversary of the arrival of Columbus in the Americas, every school would have a flag that it could ceremoniously raise. So the creation and popularization of the pledge was an intentional act based on the vision of our founders meant to both reinstill our nation with patriotic sentiment and to make money. It is in our nation's DNA to create a sense of loyalty to our ideals and to support capitalism. 
Second is the question of what is meant by all. We know that when groups of people who look the same and have similar histories, that they have a tendency to frame their statements and their work in that commonality. Our founders were a group of white land-owning men, many of whom also owned enslaved people. It created a frame for the nation they were building that excluded black people and native people because it was their own frame, because they were people and those who had to be moved or killed for them to take place on this land and those who were brought here to do the labor for that or not. And Bellamy, very deliberately chose his language in the pledge. He wanted to include the words equality and fraternity, but eventually decided against it, knowing that the state superintendents on education on his committee were against equality for women and for African-Americans. It is in our nation's DNA to think first and often only of people who look like ourselves when we say all people and to go along with the ideas of the people in power so that our personal vision might be included in the norm. Third is the question of what's meant by liberty and justice. Our founders thought of liberty and justice as the ability to throw off oppressive rule and govern themselves. Because of what they meant when they said all people, black people and indigenous people and even white women weren't part of this frame either. These white men were thinking about themselves. And as I just mentioned, Bellamy chose those terms, liberty and justice, to describe where our loyalties should lie in deliberate denial of those rights to women and to black people. He was more concerned with getting his words to be what was accepted than he was about access to liberty and justice to people it would have been unpopular to support. All of these shapers and shifters of our natural, national culture were so deeply entrenched in their own frame that they severely limited who we think of when we say all. It is in our nation's DNA to think first and often only of ourselves, of our individual selves, when we say liberty and justice, and to think of ourselves as a free nation because we rule ourselves. But I contend that we are not a free nation. I think this nation has been built on a very particular kind of foundation and that we are still today suffering from the impact of this very narrow frame that our founders brought. I don't just mean black, indigenous and people of color are suffering. I mean, all of us, we all suffer when we continue to allow state sanctioned violence against black and brown people when we excuse murder at the hands of police, when we allow immigrant families to be separated and children to live in cages, when we imprison black people at a hugely disproportionate ratio to their population. We all suffer when we buy into a fear-filled us against them mentality. We all suffer when we politicize and polarize our points of view. And in this frame, we fall into thinking we're looking out for number one by thinking first or only about upholding our individual freedom to live however we choose. But what we're really doing is putting other people at risk. And when we put other people at risk, we lose pieces of our own humanity. I think this is a big part of why we're so exhausted right now. We're not just dealing with the physical effects of a global pandemic and a cultural uprising. As the momentum builds in both of these situations, those of us who were included in the frame of our founders are having to learn to stop thinking of ourselves first. We're having to think about how we take up space and how we move around in the world, both to stop the pandemic and to learn to mean all when we say all when we think of freedom only as the ability to do whatever we want, we lose the ability to care about the impact of doing whatever we want on others. 
thinking in particular about the mask controversy. So when we're asked to consider that impact, the first thing we think of is the loss of our own freedom. And then the fear creeps in and the responses to that fear range from a general feeling of discomfort to the presence of white militants and neo-Nazis in our midst. Our faith tradition carries the counter-cultural assertion that this type of individual freedom is a false narrative. That freedom is instead rooted in connection, in accountability, in relationship, and that our ethics are relational as well. That there is a responsibility to think about the impacts when we exercise our own right to free speech and free action and to seek to come back into relationship when harm is done, even when unintended. That the most effective kind of power is the kind that we create and wield together toward the common good, rather than the kind that gives one group of people power over another. Because when we insist on individual freedom and cling to whatever power we can grab, we bump up against each other instead of affirming everyone's right to exist, to be safe, to be cared for. We work against each other instead of creating together a world that works for all of us. The resurgence of the movement for black lives that's happening right now is no coincidence and the pushback against it is no surprise. It feels to me like there's kind of a last stand happening for this idea of individualism that has divided our nation from its birth. Unitarian Universalism reminds us that we are bound to each other by threads of connectedness, that the common good isn't in conflict with our individual needs that collective liberation is so much more than individual freedom, that as Dr. King and others have told us, none of us are free until all of us are free. That's why I'm so excited that our General Assembly last week passed two actions of immediate witness that express the conscience and carry the authority of the delegates at that GA. Affirmed actions of immediate witness are used by congregations in local efforts to respond to urgent social issues and to empower the UUA's advocacy and organizing staff to take action and to recommend action. This year's actions of immediate witness are titled Address 400 Years of White Supremacist Colonialism and Amen to Uprising a commitment and call to action. I'm also excited that our association followed that up by releasing a statement of support for work to defund the police. I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about at coffee hour around that topic. Our own shadows disappear as the feet of thousands by the tens of thousands pound the fallow land into new dust, that rising like a marvelous pollen will be fertile. May it be so, may we be so. Our closing hymn today is number 1018, uh, Come and Go With Me.
time to do our offering. <laughs> Let's take a moment um, to share our wealth. As we enter this new fiscal and church year, we ask for your continued support of the ministry of this church. Your offering may be made through the PayPal link that will be shared in the chat box. The link on the screen is, is not clickable. As always, you can also mail your check to the church directly. Thank you again for your continued support of our church and its ministry as we brainstorm new ways to be together, but apart, and as we bring in thoughtful speakers who challenge and support us in our move forward, such as Reverend Karen Armina. Thank you. I offer words from my colleague, the Reverend Teresa Soto. To be free, you must embrace the breadth of your own existence without apology, even if they try to take it from you. You must know not that you can do whatever you want. You are not a kudzu vine eating entire hillsides for the purpose of feeding your own lush life. You must know instead that inside you are entire universes, milky blue, magenta, and gold expanding. But to actually be free, you must know and you must fight for the entire universes inside of everyone else. Being free is not a license, but a promise. The fox have a hole in the ground And the birds have a nest in the air And everything have a hiding place But we poor sinners have none Now ain't that hard to try our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. <laughs> 